Hello and welcome back to The Sim Hanger. Today we're going to be exploring the world of virtual reality. Are you interested in VR? Do you use VR for flight simulation? If so, stick around, this could be of interest. This will be the first in a planned series of videos looking at VR and flight simulation. We'll be exploring the different flight sim platforms that are available, the various settings and applications, hardware specifications and so on. Today we're going to be focusing on hardware and headsets. Let's get started. The recent growth and availability and diversity of VR headsets in the market at all different price points is testament to the gaining popularity of VR in all sectors. From business applications through to gaming, but what about VR in the flight simulation world? Well, Navigraph, the company best known for its navigational databases, charts, and maps, hosted a survey in 2018. Let's see what they had to say about flight sim and VR. The Navigraph 2018 survey saw almost a fourfold increase in the number of respondents, up to 15,000. Also recording almost a fourfold increase was the number of people using a VR headset for flight simulation, growing from 3% in 2017 to 11%, again a significant increase. Explain tops the leaderboard in terms of VR usage, followed by Prepared and DCS World. Aerofly FS2, strong performer and a relatively newcomer, but not surprising as it's inherently VR. Physical controls continue to dominate in the world of VR, such as yokes, pedals, keyboard and mouse, although VR hand controllers are gaining in popularity. These are the minimum recommended hardware specifications of the HTC Vive website and are pretty representative of the minimum specifications for various headsets on the market. It's a GTX 1060 graphics card or better, i5 processor with 4GB of RAM, HDMI, display and USB ports and Windows 7 or upwards. Now no doubt this specification will be fine for anything that's not graphically intensive, but for any flight simulator enthusiast with any aircraft or scenery installed, you're going to struggle at this level of hardware. Computer performance is dependent on a wide range and mix of different components that will achieve a different level of performance. But if somebody was starting off with VR in flight simulation, this would be my personal recommendation in terms of the minimum specification that one should be looking at. And that would be a GTX 1070 Ti graphics card, an i7 processor, preferably one that could be overclocked with 8GB of RAM, and the faster the better. Display ports, these are becoming more and more important and usable, particularly if you have a variable refresh rate monitor, G-Sync or FreeSync. USB 2 and for Oculus users certainly USB 3 ports, Windows 10 operating system and a solid state drive as access to and from that drive is faster than the normal physical drives. And here are my actual computer specifications. I got an RTX 2080 Ti graphics card, i7-8700 CPU, 32 gigs of RAM, USB ports, I've got a combination of USB 2 and 3s, Windows 10, a number of SSDs or solid state drives, and a number of non-volatile memory storage devices. Does this specification represent the best bang for your buck? Well, I'd have to say no, it doesn't. If you're looking for a top-end PC, I would say that uh, that specification is fairly good, but in terms of getting value for your money, I would recommend a GTX 1080 Ti as opposed to the RTX. And that's mainly because flight simulation remains predominantly CPU bound and is not taking advantage 
of the extra memory and functionality of the newer graphics cards and in particular the RTX. So in terms of bang for your buck, I would be recommending a GTX 1080 or 1080 Ti. As we're using a headset for VR, the monitor specifications are not critical. However, for anybody looking to get a new monitor, I would recommend a variable refresh rate monitor. The benefits of that is it can substantially reduce the effect of stuttering and tearing. At the top end is the G-Sync monitor, NVIDIA certified but typically carrying a two to three hundred US dollar price premium. Not carrying anything near that premium is AMD's FreeSync, which is now supported by NVIDIA drivers. I did a video on the variable refresh rate and the support by NVIDIA and I'll leave a link in the notes below for anybody wanting to find out more about this. To improve the level of immersion in the past one had to build a full-size cockpit. But now VR headsets and VR technology is making that more of a reality for more of us. VR allows us to sit directly inside the cockpit and interact with the aircraft and our surroundings. There are a few drawbacks, however, mainly associated to graphics quality, although as time goes on, that gap is narrowing. Whilst it's beyond the scope of this video to look at all headsets on the market as the range is massive, we will be looking at the major players and the major categories. And the first category we're going to be looking at is Microsoft's implementation of VR Windows Mixed Reality. Any prices that I may quote from time to time are only valid at the time of recording this video. And the pound price seems to be one for one with the US price. So if I say a price is 299, the chances are it's 299 US dollars and also 299 pounds. Windows Mixed Reality headsets tend to be at the less expensive end on the price range for VR headsets. They also utilize inside out tracking through two cameras built into the headset. And what this does is it tracks the movement of the headset and the controllers without the need for base stations as some of the other players in the market require. This is both a benefit in terms of speed and ease of setup, but also the tracking of the controllers may not be quite as good or accurate as those with base stations. Windows Mixed Reality headsets are available from a wide range of fairly well-known suppliers, such as Samsung, Dell, Acer, Lenovo, Hewlett Packard, and so on. Prices for these headsets vary considerably Typically 299 through to 499, sometimes 599, depending on time of year and sales promotion on at any given time. But that's not the only thing that varies between these headsets. The quality, comfort and screen resolution and lens type varies considerably. OLED is preferable to LCD, so it's certainly a try before you buy Users of these headsets are not restricted to the Microsoft Store for their games and applications. It's fully compatible with Steam VR. The other major player in the market, of course, is the HTC Vive. The HTC Vive price has dropped considerably from originally 799 down to about 499 currently, although spending an extra 100 is recommended on the deluxe audio strap as it provides earphones and improves the comfort considerably strongly recommended. The HTC Vive can access Steam VR and uses base stations and probably has the best tracking in the market currently. The other major player in the market of course is the Oculus Rift. The price for the Oculus Rift is typically 399 sometimes as high as 499 and does vary from location to location. It has the advantage of headphones being built in and comes with two base stations, which is fine for any static type VR application. However, if you want room scale, you'll need to fork out another 60 for another base station. 
It doesn't inherently have access to Steam VR and the games and applications within that, although there are a number of workarounds. Based on third-party reviews and feedback, I've picked four of the more popular or more common headsets used in the market currently. Whilst the level of immersion is unequaled arguably in VR, there are a number of compromises. The first one is obviously wearing the headset itself. And again, the weight of a headset is very important and another reason to try before you buy. The other problem with wearing a headset is access to charts and maps and third-party portals, etc. Although there are applications that will give you this option, such as Fly Inside. And I'll be looking at this and other associated items in my next video. Obviously, resolution is very, very important and not all headsets are created equal. Having said that, however, the right headset for you is going to be a combination of not just the resolution, but the comfort, the weight and so on. Something very much of personal preference. Let's have a look at the resolution of the four headsets that are the most common. Both the Oculus Rift and HTC Vive have the same resolution of 1080 by 1200 per eye. Both the Lenovo Explorer and Samsung Odyssey have a higher resolution, with the Samsung Odyssey having the highest resolution of all of 1440 by 1600 pixels per eye. Because your eyes are so close to the lenses in the headset, there is something called screen door effect, and that is where you can actually see the definition between the pixels. The higher the resolution, the less impact the SDE or screen door effect has on your visibility. I use the HTC Vive personally, and when first putting it on, the screen door effect is quite visible. But I quickly adjust to it, and after a short period of time, I don't really notice that it's there. But the theory is, the higher the resolution, the less screen door effect you will experience. There is some screen door effect on the Lenovo Explorer, but that is probably because of the LCD panel. Another important aspect is the IPD, or interpupillary distance. This is the distance between the center of one eye to the center of the other eye, and ensuring the lenses are lined up accordingly. On the HTC Vive and Samsung Odyssey, this is a manual physical adjustment on the headset itself, which is preferable to a software adjustment, which is the case with the Oculus and the Lenovo Explorer. The manual IPD adjustment or interpupillary distant adjustment on the Vive, for example, you will find it here on the underside of the headset. And by turning this, what it does is it allows the lenses to move fractionally in or out, slightly wider apart or slightly closer together to match your eyes and therefore give you the best chance of the best focus. This is an important adjustment and often one overlooked. The field of view is also an important aspect for headsets and all of the four headsets here have a field of view of 110 degrees, which is pretty standard within headsets at this time, with a few exceptions which I'll be coming on to shortly. The lenses are machined with concentric circles on them to aid distortion. But what this means is each headset has a sweet spot where the clarity is best. It's worth experimenting until such time as you find that sweet spot. And remember, don't wear your headset as you would a pair of glasses. Wear it as you would a ski mask. Moving now on to controllers. Controllers are used to interact with the environment around you, although we're not restricted just to the use of controllers in VR. The Vive uses what they call the wand. It's a fairly large controller with a trackpad, a trigger and a number of buttons. Windows Mixed Reality controllers all look pretty similar, have a trackpad, number of buttons and a joystick. The Oculus Rift controllers, on the other hand, or knuckle controllers as they're often called, are probably the most intuitive and easiest to use. Turning back now to headsets, let's have a look at some of the more recent entrants into the market. 
And first and foremost, let's have a look at the HTC Vive Pro, which was launched to considerable media cover, mainly because of its price point, topping a thousand, and that excluded base stations and controllers. Currently, the price is around 799, again, excluding base stations and controllers. It boasts higher resolution of 1440 by 1600 per eye. This puts the resolution level pegging with the Samsung Odyssey. In addition, HTC have announced the wireless adapter. And what this allows you to do is no longer be tethered by cables to your computer, as is the case with most headsets. This further enhances one of the main strengths of the Vive range, which is room scale VR. A good router and internet is a prerequisite due to the graphical intensity of VR to make this a practical option for you. The other new entrance into the market is a Chinese company called Pimax, and they've launched two new headsets into the market, the 5K and the 8K. The 5K has a whooping 2560 by 1440 per eye and boasts a field of view of 200 degrees, which is pretty close to the human's normal field of view of between 210 and 220 degrees. The 8K boasts even a higher resolution. Pimax have started accepting orders, although they're only shipping to the initial backers at this time, the 5 and 8K, and that's without the controllers or the base stations. The price around 699. A point to note here is that the Pimax software, PyTool, is still very much in its beta phase. There are a number of other headsets planned to be launched over the next year or two, which also boast the wide 200 degree field of view, such as Star VR. I haven't covered them here, as they're more towards the business focus rather than home entertainment. Both HTC and Primax have announced plans to incorporate eye tracking into their headsets. What eye tracking is, it tracks the movement of your eyes and pushes as many pixels to exactly where you're looking and therefore giving you a clearer picture, particularly with wider fields of view. There are a number of headsets uh, similar to the Oculus Go in the market at this time. The Oculus Go is a standalone headset. It doesn't require a PC in order to operate and because of that and the nature of flight simulation, it's not suitable. Oculus are bringing out the Oculus Quest in 2019, I believe, and this again will be a standalone headset, so unlikely to be suitable for flight simming. The Vive Cosmos, on the other hand, the details are a little hazy from HTC, surprise, but again it should be out in 2019 and will be connected to the PC, so one to keep an eye on. Here are a number of what I consider to be important considerations in terms of flying in VR. The better the resolution, the greater clarity and better graphics that you experience and so improve the immersion of the whole experience. However, the higher the resolution, the higher spec and beefier computer you're going to need in order to push those pixels through to the headset. Depending on how deep your pockets are, it's always worthwhile getting something at a higher specification if you can afford it so that you future-proof to some degree, although that's a never-ending battle in the world of computers. Most headsets operate at a speed of 90 hertz, and the reason it's 90 hertz is they need to push through 90 frames per second. 90 frames per second is needed in order for the VR experience to be a smooth one. If it drops well below the 90, then you're going to get a lot of juddering, stuttering and tearing, and that can lead quickly to motion sickness in the headset. The way 90 frames per second is achieved is VR uses something called a synchronous projection or a synchronous time warp. And what this is essentially is that it will duplicate or multiply the frames in order to build up the difference between the actual frame rate and 90 frames per second. Providing your hardware is up to the task, you then get a smooth experience. If not, that's when problems occur. 
so the key is to have the hardware capable of pushing 90 frames per second in VR. There is a wide and diverse range of accessories for flight simulation. Not all of them are suitable for VR. A fully-fledged cockpit with dials and gauges, well, that's not very useful because you can't see it. However, I do use a yoke and a rudder. I don't use the throttles. I use the ones in the cockpit as I find them difficult to locate and control. But I do use a Satex trim control, for example. I also use something called the butt kicker, and this is a vibration device that fits to the chair. And the vibrations are in tune with the flight simulation and increases the level of immersion. Leap Motion is a hardware and software add-on for VR and I use it with my Vive headset. And what this allows you to do is use your hands as controllers in the cockpit. And so the list goes on all the way up to motion chairs for those with particularly deep pockets. Setup for the various headsets is fairly straightforward and most of them include a number of basic application or games just to get you familiar with using the headset and controllers. Well, thanks for sticking with me. The choice of headset and hardware specification is one to suit individual preferences and pockets, and a wide range of views exist on this. Those expressed here today are purely my own. The prices for hardware and headsets continue to change, so keep up to date via the internet. For some strange reason, the Samsung Odyssey the headset with one of the best resolutions is not available for sale in Europe. If you're looking to establish what your IPD is, there's numerous articles on the internet and on YouTube. Coming up will be the second in the series covering VR. We'll be looking at the flight simulator platforms, explain, Aerofly, prepared and so on. I hope you'll join me then and bye for now.